and get started. Uh, Happy New Year. Welcome back, everybody, to Statistical Rethinking. Uh, I'm Richard, and this week we're going to do multiple regression and sort of the foundations of uh, a framework for doing causal inference. Uh, and I think the best thing to do to get into that is just um, get into the first empirical example. Uh, so I went to college in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which is in the southern United States, the former Confederate states, if some of you know American history. And uh, there are many things about the South uh, that I like. Uh, and uh, those are the parts that I like to talk about. <laughs> and uh, one of those things is Waffle House. Uh, Waffle House is exactly what it says. It's a house of waffles <laughs> and uh, also hash browns and other greasy food. And it's always open. Like you, you, there's no like opening or closing hours. It's literally always open. That's the whole principle of the business is that when other things are closed, you can always find a Waffle House, look for the yellow globe. Uh, sometimes at freeway exits, there are two Waffle Houses. There'll be one on each side of the exit because uh, it is so important to the commerce of the southern states. Um, other things that are present in the south which are not as nice uh, include hurricanes, uh, tropical depressions that wander northward and uh, intersect with the Waffle Houses and everything else at various times. And from here in the comfort of Europe, we you know look on in horror at these tropical storms. But having been near these things myself, I can tell you they're no joke. Uh, Waffle House, because it is associated with tropical storms, invests in disaster preparedness. As a business, their model is to be always open, and they really mean it. Even when there's a hurricane, uh, they, they are often the only thing that stays open during a hurricane. This one closed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they typically are open, and the lines outside of a Waffle House just after a uh, tropical storm are really something, because it will be the only place you can get waffles, <laughs> right, uh, for hundreds of kilometers. <laughs> Um, they're so reliable, in fact, that the uh, United States government actually has something uh, they call the Waffle House uh, Index, which is an index of how bad a storm was. Uh, if the Waffle House is, house is closed, that was a really bad storm. Uh, and then they bring in more trucks and, and relief and, and such. And this is for real. Uh, this is uh, Craig uh, Fugate, who is, uh, until recently, director of FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States. And uh, uh, they really use this Waffle House Index uh, internally um, in FEMA, uh, in the southern states, obviously. You can only do this in the southern states uh, because there are no Waffle Houses outside of the south. The Waffle House was founded in the south, and it has uh, spread among the southern states and has very high densities within the south. There are other things about the south. Uh, uh, Lots of things about the South which are idiosyncratic in the United States. Uh, hurricanes, Waffle Houses, and also divorce. Uh, the Southern states have the highest divorce rates of many of the states in the South. Uh, and this sets up a bunch of interesting and I want to posit spurious correlations between Waffle House and many, many other things. Basically, anything that is idiosyncratic about the Southern states will be correlated with Waffle House. And so if you were naive and really eager to make some causal inference about Waffle House, like you were out to get them to close their business, you could find any bad thing about the South and show it was correlated with Waffle Houses in a, in a regression. Uh, for example, divorce. Uh, Waffle House is ruining marriages. The fact that it's always open, these guys are going to Waffle House late at night and having waffles and then, you know, divorce. <laughs> right? And I don't know. Wave my hands here. Uh, but in a regression, it's quite robust, actually. Um, I show here on the horizontal waffle houses per million uh, people. Uh, you got to do it per capita, right? <laughs> There's a saturation effect. And, uh, and then the divorce rate among uh, the 50 United States. And you'll see that the, um, there's a very strong correlation here. Uh, in fact, uh, statistically, it's quite hard to get rid of it, actually. Uh, nevertheless, I believe this is spurious. Uh, I, I do not believe there is a causal influence on this. But nature is full of stuff like this. And usually, it's not so ridiculous. It's hard to know. Uh, but correlation is commonplace in nature. It's not rare. There's a whole website which specializes in fishing through uh, longitudinal data sets to find spurious and ridiculous correlations. I, I encourage you to uh, visit it, the Spurious Correlations web website. The URL is on the bottom of this slide. Uh, here's a great example. Uh, the, you can correlate the divorce rate in Maine over time with the per capita consumption of margarine. Uh, it's a very nice correlation. Uh, correlation is 0.99, right? Must be causal, right? No, of course not, because correlation uh, uh, correlation is commonplace in nature. 
Lots of things will generate a high correlation between two variables, even if they have no causal relationship with one another. Uh, so what are our goals this week? Uh, well, mechanically, I want to introduce you to multiple regression. Uh, you know, most of you know uh, a lot about multiple regression already. You probably have published multiple regression analyses, but I'm going to teach it to you all over again, as if you didn't know anything about it. Uh, and I have uh, the goal of both building it up and breaking it down. Uh, the good parts of multiple regression is that it can show us plausible true causes of things. It can remove uh, uh, spurious correlations, like the case of Waffle House being correlated with any number of things. Uh, and it can uncover mass dissociations that you wouldn't see otherwise, uh, just in uh, regressions with a single predictor variable. Uh, but it can also do bad things. Adding variables to models can do just as much harm as good. Um, you can actually cause spurious correlations by adding variables to a multiple regression. I don't think this is often taught, so I want to really hit this quite hard this week. Um, and you can actually hide real associations as well by adding variables. So uh, you need some broader structure to think about your decision to add variables. Simply throwing everything into a multiple regression is uh, a recipe for doom, and uh, we do not want to do this. Um, so making decisions between the good and the bad is going to require that we have some framework for doing causal inference. And so that's what I'll try uh, to give you as well this week. Uh, and this means directed acyclic graphs. I'll tell you what that means when we get there. Uh, often abbreviated DAGs, right? It's like a dog. If you're in a certain part of Ireland, it's how a dog is pronounced, DAG. Uh, and uh, things like forks, pipes, and colliders, which are the components of these graphs. Um, and how to understand them. And the goal is to learn something called the backdoor criterion, which is a criterion by which you can figure out if adding a variable is warranted by the causal inference you want to make. OK, let's go back um, to divorce, not to Waffle House. Let's leave Waffle House aside. We'll loop back to Waffle House maybe at the end of the week, and I'll bring it back in. Um, but let's, let's stick with the divorce rate example. Waffle House doesn't cause divorce, but something does. Why does the South have high divorce rates? And there's a lot of uh, effort put into figuring this out, actually, because the divorce rates are so much higher in the southern states, uh, a place which is actually more religious than the rest of the country as well. And so there's, there's something that scratches in our head about this. Um, uh, there's lots of things um, that are correlated with divorce rate. Uh, so, for example, marriage rate. Here's a bit another variable we could get for the, the same 50 states. The rate of marriage is also correlated with the rate of divorce. Uh, could be uh, that, well, I mean, you can't get divorced if you haven't gotten married, right? Uh, so it could be true. Uh, but it could also just be a spurious correlation. And how do we go about figuring this out? There's no reason uh, that a higher marriage rate has to cause more divorce, right? Uh, a high marriage rate could indicate that it's a society that uh, uh, views marriage favorably, and that means you have lower divorce rates. And right? it doesn't necessarily make any sense, so this could just be a spurious correlation. Um, how are we going to figure this out? Uh, there's another variable uh, that is also correlated with divorce rate, but in the other direction, and that's the median age of marriage. States where people get married younger, like the southern United States, also have higher divorce rates. Right? So which of these two correlations is plausibly causal. All right, what I've showed you here are just two uh, bivariate regressions, like the models we did last year. Right? Uh, remember, we did simple regressions on height. We just had one explanatory variable. The two models I'm showing you on this slide are just models just like that. Uh, and you run them with the kind of code I showed you in chapter four. Uh, what we want to do now is put both of these horizontal axis variables in the same model. Uh, and understand what that does and why that reveals that one of these is an imposter, uh, almost certainly. So what is multiple regression for? Uh, it's for answering this basic kind of question. Uh, what is the value of some predictor variable, of knowing that predictor variable, once we know the other predictor variables? Right. So all these predictor variables are, are correlated to some extent with one another and with the outcome, typically. Uh, but they have partial correlations, which are revealing of the additional information above and beyond that correlation structure. Uh, so let me walk you through this. In the context of the divorce rate example, we've got two questions in a model that includes both. The first is, what is the value of knowing or learning the marriage rate of a state once you already know the median age of marriage of a state? 
do, do you get any additional predictive leverage from the second variable once you know the first? And then the other direction is, well, what's the value of knowing median age of marriage once you already know the marriage rate? Does this make some sense? Uh, and once I show you the full examples, hopefully it'll, it'll come across. Um, so let's, let's do our first egg. Uh, hopefully someone here knows, knows who Brent is, right? Uh, DAG stand for directed acyclic graphs. This is, these are heuristic tools for drawing causal models. They're not mechanistic analytical models, but they're incredibly useful for disciplining your thinking. Uh, eventually you want some much more uh, me mechanical model. Uh, they're called directed acyclic graphs. The directed stands for arrows. Uh, the, the, the edges have direction to them. Uh, they can be bi-directional. They don't have to just be one directional, but they have to have some direction. And those directions indicate causal relationships, that something influences the other thing. They're acyclic, meaning that you don't have loops in causation. Now, of course, nature does have loops in causation, but those loops in causation happen over time in a time series. Uh, and you can represent that in a DAG, but the DAG gets really big because you guys work with like T1 T and T2 and so on, and they get huge. Um, you can't have any cycles. Uh, and they're called graphs because they are graphs. Graphs just mean nodes and edges. The nodes are variables, and the edges are causal relationships. These are different than statistical models. Statistical models don't have directionality. It, the, the associations in a statistical model, including a Bayesian network, which is what you've been doing so far, Bayesian networks. Uh, you didn't know it, but congratulations. You're doing machine learning. <laughs> right? Everything's machine learning. Linear regression is a machine learning model, haven't you heard? And uh, these things are all Bayesian networks. Bayesian networks don't have directionality to them. They learn statistical associations and conditional associations, but they don't have causal information about direction. What a graph like this does instead is it, it posits that something influences the other thing. And this makes a difference. Uh, and you'll be learning about those differences this week. So let's think about this in the context of the divorce rate um, example. We have this graph here with our three variables. A is the median age of marriage in a state. M is the marriage rate in that state, and D is divorce rate. Uh, here's what I posit is a, a plausible graph of the causal influences here. Median age of marriage influences both the marriage rate and the divorce rate. How does it influence uh, the marriage rate? Well, if, it, if people get married younger, then you get more marriage because there are more people available to get married at younger ages. Right. So you'll get a higher marriage rate in states where people get married younger just as a consequence of the fact that they get married younger. Yeah, because there are more people alive at younger ages. Yeah. In the southern states, at least. There are other states, but that's not true. But in the southern states, that's true. Uh, and then median age of marriage influences divorce rate uh, because, well, no one knows for sure, but there's a lot of research that suggests the reason that median age of marriage is a causal influence on divorce rate is because young people make worse decisions. Right. So now we don't know that this is the true case, but this is a widespread conjecture in the literature to explain this correlation uh, is that if you get married older, you make a better choice. Uh, another explanation would be when you're younger, you're rapidly changing in your personality and your desires. And so you could make a perfectly good match at that time, but then you grow apart. Yeah. And that's no tragedy. It's just life. Right. So uh, regardless, we're going to posit there's an arrow. Uh, you, there's, the question is, this arrow from M to D, from marriage rate to divorce rate, is that arrow there? Uh, is there a causal influence of marriage rate on divorce rate as well? And that's what we want to test with the multiple regression. Uh, we want to tell the difference between, um, uh, oh, I should say something about the past before I go to the next slide. So. Uh, we're going to look at these kinds of graphs, these DAGs, and we're going to talk a lot about paths. What's a path? A path is some direction you could go following from nodes to arrows to get from one variable to another. And what I want you can, when you're following a path, you can go against the arrows. Imagine yourself just walking on the lines, and you don't care about the arrows. Causation does, but you don't. You're a physical tourist. And you're going to walk along these DAGs. So if, you're, if you've got a path from A to D, there are two paths in this graph from A to D. There's a direct path, which is the direct causal path. We'd like to know that. That's a direct effect. And then there's the indirect effect of median age of marriage, which goes A, M, D. You see this, these two paths on the graph? Yeah. And in bigger graphs, there are lots of paths between two variables. And that's life, right? And that's why they pay us the big bucks to do research. Yeah. So um, we want to tell the difference between these two uh, DAGs. The one on the left, where 
there is a direct path from M to D and the one where that's deleted because there's no causal influence really of marriage rate. And uh, multiple regression can, in principle, tell us the difference between these two things. But bivariate regressions cannot. Just knowing that you have some association between marriage and divorce doesn't tell you the difference, the difference between these two DAGs. Why? Uh, because um, A influences M and A influences D that generates a correlation between divorce and marriage rate, even if marriage rate doesn't influence. Uh, so we're going to look at the graph on the right here, right? So A is a common cause of marriage rate and divorce, and so marriage rate and divorce end up correlated, right? This is like Waffle Houses and divorce, right? So uh, something causes <laughs> Waffle House and also causes divorce. Being in the South is what it is. I'll do this regression for you uh, later. <laughs> uh, being in the South causes Waffle Houses and it also causes divorce indirectly. And so it's a, it's a common cause, uh, and they, those two things end up being correlated even though there's no causal relationship between them. Does this make sense? Uh, this is one way to think about it is, A is a confound between M and D. Right? If you were trying to infer the causal connection between marriage rate and divorce rate, then agent marriage is a confound. Yeah? I'll have a precise definition of confound later that has to do with how these graphs work, but just bear with me. I don't want to overload things right now. You ready for this? Is it good? Yeah? Okay. A uh, little bit of notation on the bottom here. We, need the, we want to know the conditional association between M and D and this vertical bar, I'm going to call it a pipe. Uh, that's what it's called in typography. It's called a pipe. You should read it as conditional on. So the association between M and D, conditional on knowing A. Once you know A, is there any extra value, any extra association you get uh, between the two? And that's what multiple regression can tell us. So what does a multiple regression model look like? Uh, it looks like uh, an ordinary bivariate regression, but with extra terms in the linear model. So you already know how to do these, really. You just have to make more stuff in the linear model. So let me walk you through this to remind you. It was last year, after all, when we did this last. Uh, a linear regression is a, a special kind of a Bayesian network where there's an outcome variable, which is assigned um, a Gaussian. Uh, probability for each observation with some mean which can, is conditional on things we know about each case we call those predictive variables and some standard deviation which is typically constant it doesn't have to be uh, and then our mean mu sub i the sub i means it's conditional in each case i the i's here are states yeah uh, has some intercept then you'll have uh, slopes times uh, predictive variables in each case so now we're going to have two we're going to have uh, M sub I, the marriage rate in each state, and some slope to measure the, the partial association of that with the outcome after already knowing uh, agent marriage, and symmetrically for agent marriage. We've got a slope for agent marriage, and then we have the uh, median agent marriage in each state. Good? Yeah? Not too shocking. Okay, we've got to talk about priors. Um, so I, we're going to have to think harder about priors now once we start doing uh, these sorts of models and I'm going to spend some more time doing prior predictive simulations with you. So it helps a lot with linear regressions to standardize the variables because it makes the priors easier to set, to set them reasonable. What does standardization mean? It means you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So your, your variables are now z-scores. Yeah? Psychologists know z-scores, right? This is, your life is z-scores. Um, Biologists, some, depends upon what your tradition is in biology, whether you use z-scores or not. Uh, so if you make all your variables z-scores, it makes things a little easier. Uh, not in all cases, but in this case it does. So we standardize divorce rate and marriage rate and median age at marriage. The consequence of this is that, remember the meaning of the parameter alpha, we need a prior for alpha. The meaning of alpha is it's the, vet, it's the expected value of the outcome when all the predictors are zero. When you standardize the predictors, zero is their mean. Yeah? So now alpha has the meaning of the expected value of the outcome when all the predictors are at their expected values. Now we can set it. Uh, right? What should it be? Zero. Because your outcome is also standardized. And the mean of a standardized variable in the whole sample compared to all the others has to be zero. It's just by definition. It has to be true. The, the regression line has to pass through the expectation of these things of all these things. Uh, so we, we have a very strong prior expectation that alpha should be zero. So we'll, choose, we'll give it a Gaussian prior with a tight standard deviation. In fact, even tighter than this would be good. As you'll see, it'll be zero. 
Uh, it's like a mathematical destiny. That it has to be zero as a consequence of standardizing the variables. If you hadn't done that, well, what are you going to do? What is alpha? Well, I don't know. Do you, I'm not an expert in divorce rates. <laughs> right? What's a median rate? You don't know prior to seeing the data. And priors are about expectations about the parameters before you see the sample. Right? You want to set them based upon background scientific knowledge, not upon peaking. Yeah, don't use the data twice. Um, slopes, uh, this is a little harder, and this is where I encourage you to do some prior predictive simulation. Uh, you don't want the slopes to produce oddly impossibly strong relationships to start. Uh, so if you use flat priors here, uh, that's going to produce some incredible nonsense. And in the text, I show you how to simulate anything you like. Let me walk you through the code just a little bit to figure it out, what we do. Um, in chapter four, we just used random number generating functions in R to simulate priors. There's another way you can do it. You can fit your model. Here's the, the QAP model for the multiple regression. Uh, no, just a single regression between divorce rate and age of marriage to keep it simple. Uh, there's this, uh, you can run that model. Uh, there's this function in the rethinking package called extract prior. And this samples from the prior instead of the posterior. All this does is use R norm. <laughs> to sample, right? It reads the formula and it says, oh, you said that BA has a normal uh, prior with 0 0.5 and then it samples from that and gives you samples from it. It's, it's a convenience function. You could do this on, on your own uh, or you can use extract prior. And then we can just pass it to link. Remember link? We used it to generate predictions. Now we're generating predictions here but for from the prior. This is the prior predictive simulation. What does the model think before you gave it the data? Right, this is a way to see if the model is done. <laughs> right. What does the model think before you give it the data? Um, and then you can plot the regression lines. And what, what you think of it this way, remember, the posterior is full of lines. How many lines? An infinite number. Every line that can exist is inside the posterior distribution, but it's rated in a different plausibility. And in the posterior, it'll be incredibly truncated down to what the sample justifies. But in the prior, well, that's what you plug in. And so if you want to see what you plugged in is ridiculous or not, you need to simulate from the prior. For simple models, you can get away with not doing this because the sample will overwhelm even incredibly ridiculous priors, uh, like flat ones. Uh, but with more complicated models, uh, even large samples won't overwhelm the priors. So you've got to get used to doing this. Uh, we're going to practice this when it's safe uh, because uh, you want to be good at it when it's not safe. Right? Uh, so what does this end up looking like if we have this prior um, uh, on the slope? Gaussian prior centered at zero with a standard deviation of a half. These are the regression lines you sample. Uh, I forget how many this is. 50 regression lines sampled from the prior. Uh, let me walk you through this plot. We're looking at standardized median age of marriage. So the two here means two standard deviations. Right? So that's the vast majority of the outcome space by definition. Almost all the possible observed median ages of marriage that you're going to see. Uh, and then same for divorce rate. Two means two z-scores out, two standard deviations out. Does this make sense? Uh, if your regression lines don't live in this space, your prior is bad because it's impossible. Right? If, you're, if, you think the, if your model thinks prior to the data that median age of marriage is going to give you more extreme slopes than this, that it goes out of the observable range of divorce rates, then the prior is bad. Right? I think that's a simple scientific criterion for a good prior. Uh, right now within this we could quibble about how strong uh, uh, how tight we want this to be this prior allows really strong relationships it allows for median age of marriage to govern almost all the variation uh, in divorce rate which is probably not true right but this prior allows that I think that's too strong and when we get to the overfitting chapter I can make a, a more forceful argument about why this is probably uh, this prior is not uh, uh, tight enough uh, uh, for safe work uh, but we'll move forward with this. You want to think about this as the flattest prior you could justify scientifically. Anything flatter than this, like the priors implied by a typical frequentist analysis, uh, consider impossible results as perfectly plausible. Right? Plausibly just crazy strong lines that basically go straight up on this graph will be sampled from a prior that's flat. Right? Remember, a flat prior thinks that infinity is a perfectly reasonable slope. Yeah, and it's not. I pause it. <laughs> okay. Here's our model now, uh, armed with our priors. We're going to be doing more prior predictive simulation. It'll get fun when we get to interactions. Uh, so uh, just to summarize it, we've got the probability of data up at the top, uh, yieldy linear model as the second line, now with two terms. And 
Linear means additive, remember. Um, uh, so really this, this mu makes a plane, right? Because it's like a two-dimensional uh, linear surface. It, but these are additive. Uh, you keep adding terms together where there's some coefficient, some parameter times uh, the predictor variable. Uh, then we have priors. There are four parameters in this model now. Uh, there's alpha, two slopes, and then uh, sigma. And I give it this exponential prior now. I'm going to start using exponential priors uh, more habitually instead of uniform priors because they have nice properties which we'll talk about when we get to chapter 10, I think. I can unveil why I like this. Uh, one way to think about this is it's got the right, cons right constraint. Exponential distributions are always positive numbers. Right? That's one way to think about what's good about it. The other thing is it's skeptical of really, really big values. Uh, and you're setting, uh, the value you put in there is, is setting the, the average value that you expect the standard deviation to be at. OK. Uh, here's the, the quack code. You've seen this before. Uh, no mysteries here. And we run it and we get table of coefficients. Yay. Uh, and one lesson of this course is that these tables are hard to interpret, but you're going to see them and it's worth thinking about what goes on here. You're probably already gazing in there and you're looking for p-values and they're not there. Ha. Huh? But uh, what do you want to look for? Well, you want to look at uh, the mean. That's the posterior mean of the posterior distribution of each parameter. Um, as I promised, alpha is zero. Right? Had to be. It just had to be. Uh, had to be zero. And uh, then uh, BM uh, for marriage rate, it's slightly negative, but the standard deviation is about twice the size of the absolute uh, value of the, of the posterior mean itself. So if you look at the 89% um, compatibility interval over there, it goes from minus 0.3 uh, to plus uh, 0.2. Um, maybe it has an effect, maybe it doesn't. It could be either direction, according to this model. It just doesn't know what to think uh, about it. But there's no consistent relationship, no consistent association uh, in the multiple regression between marriage rate and divorce. Age of marriage, however, uh, it's uh, minus 0.6. Um, standard deviation is the same as the other one, but now the posterior mass is entirely below zero. There's a reliably negative association between uh, median age of marriage and the divorce rate. What's the lesson of this? You probably already know. It's that uh, there probably is no direct causal impact of marriage rate on divorce rate. It was masquerading because age of marriage is a confound between the two. Age of marriage is actually causal. We can look at this um, in these uh, dot and line charts instead. This is the same information that's in that uh, table that was just come out. In fact, if you put wrap plot around the Precy call, you get this plot. Um, this is what it produces. And uh, uh, well, actually, this is COF tab, sorry, because this is all three models. Uh, but the code's in the book to do this. So remember, model 5.1, age of marriage only. Um, it's the bottom row in each of the parameter uh, uh, batches there. Uh, you'll see it's in the model with only um, age of marriage, it's negative. The model with only median age of marriage, uh, marriage rate, sorry, if I, it's, the estimate's positive. Uh, but then in the multiple regression, uh, which is model 5.3, you'll see that uh, the posterior distribution for marriage rate moves towards zero and gets wide, right? which is the knockout effect of putting in uh, the common cause, which is median age of marriage. Does that make sense? This is a good thing multiple regression for do for do for us, and I believe that this is actually the causal relationship here. Um, so this is probably the graph we have, right? Or if there is an arrow from marriage rate to divorce rate, it's it's not a strong arrow; it's weak. Um, but this is the connection between the two. So in words now, how could you interpret this? Well, once you know the median age of marriage for a state, you learn almost nothing else by also learning the marriage rate in that state. And that's consistent with the graph that I have on this slide where there's no direct causal influence from marriage rate to divorce rate. At the same time, once you know the marriage rate, there's still a lot of value in learning median age of marriage. Right? It works the other direction. And that's consistent with the idea that uh, age of marriage is a, is a common cause of median age of marriage rate and divorce rate. Keep in mind, if you didn't know the median age of marriage in a state, there's still value in learning the, mean, in the marriage rate, right? Because it gives you information. But that information comes from 
another causal relationship. It doesn't come from a direct causal relationship between the two variables. And that's what our business is here in inference, is to figure out the difference between those things. If you just wanted to make a prediction and you didn't care about causal inference, marriage rate is useful. It helps you predict stuff. But it doesn't help you do interventions in the world because if you wanted to go and like change divorce rate in a state and you, you manipulated marriage rate, it would have no effect, right? Because that's not how it works. Uh, instead, you need to manipulate the age of marriage, give people incentives to postpone their marriages or things like that. I should not actually make policy recommendations here. <laughs> but uh, um, actually, East Germany, where I'm giving this lecture from, there's lots of interesting stuff that happens after 1989 with marriage rates. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it in another lecture. I'll put up some graphs. Uh, there was a nice natural experiment in this. But um, uh, you have to be clear about, the lesson of this, you have to be clear about whether you're interested in only predicting things or also inferring causal relationships so that you can intervene. An intervention requires a true causal understanding of the system. Prediction doesn't. Right? So I think this is the, the, the terror of science, is that you can make really good predictions without understanding anything. Remember the geocentric model? Right? Statistical models are not sufficient to figure out causal relationships. You need something extra. Okay. Um, how do we visualize models like this? And the answer, unfortunately, is lots of ways. Uh, let me give you just a few examples real quick here. And um, uh, the text will be full of uh, additional examples for particular models. And I think the fact is that usually the most useful way to visualize the posterior distribution for any particular model depends upon the model and the topic you're studying. And so there's no standard just command you want to execute all the time. You want to think about what you're trying to communicate and the comparisons you want your readers to make. Uh, so let me give you a few examples. Uh, the first one is going to be predictor residual plots, which is actually not something that I recommend doing very often, but it's really useful to help you understand how regression works. And so I'm going to do it once in this course and then never again. Uh, but it's really good for understanding how regression functions. It's not necessarily so good for, for communicating results. The second are called counterfactual plots. They're counterfactual because you imagine manipulating any one of the variables, leaving all the others unchanged, and you do stuff with the predictions and you see how the model sees things. Um, and then uh, posterior prediction checks, uh, uh, which we've done before, but I'll show you how you do it in the multivariate context. Okay. What is a, a predictor residual plot? Uh, the purpose of these plots is to show how the association uh, of a variable with the outcome uh, looks having controlled for the other predictors. So inside the machinery of this model, how does it see the relationships among things? And that's what we want to do. We can calculate those intermediate states, even though you don't normally ever see them and they just happen sort of magically in the calculations. This is great for intuition. It's terrible for analysis. There's a tradition in biology, unfortunately, of analyzing residuals, uh, especially in life history theory. You should never do this. And I mean that never. There is never any statistical justification for running a regression on residuals. And you'll see this. This used to be what people did before multiple regression. Uh, you would do a bivariate regression. You get the residuals between those two. And then you take those residuals and put them in as predictors in another model. You should never, never do this. Why? Because it gives you the wrong answer. Uh, but it's useful for understanding how the model sees things. Uh, but it gives you the wrong answer because it gives you the wrong uncertainties and it gives you bias estimates. Uh, again, mainly biologists who do this bad tradition and it's taught, but you should never ever do it. What should you do instead? A multiple regression. Uh, analyzing residuals is what multiple regression is designed to do. <laughs> you don't analyze the residuals, okay? I know you'll see it in journals, uh, but you know, it's, it's off-label use. Um, okay, what's the recipe? You regress a predictor on another predictor Right? So in this case, that's going to be age of marriage on marriage rate. So then you get the association between the two, and then you can find the extra variance that's left over after that association. And then you, those are the residuals. And then you want to look at the pattern of relationship between those residuals and the outcome. Again, this is useful for understanding how the model sees things. But you don't want to run it this way because you're not, you don't know the residuals. Uh, I'll loop back to this point at the end. Let me push through the residuals first. Okay. Here's our first residual plot. I'm going to fill this slide with four different plots. Uh, here's the first one. Let me zoom in on it. What are we looking at here? We're looking at a regression of marriage rate standardized on age at marriage standardized for all the states. And there's a regression line that passes through. Uh, and then the distance from that regression line, 
which is the expected value, remember, of marriage rate, conditional on agent marriage, that distance is called a residual. Right? It's the unexplained bit uh, for each case from the model. Does this make sense? Just that line. That distance, the absolute distance of that line is called the residual. And I've highlighted uh, some of the <laughs> states with high residuals. Right? Hawaii has a very high marriage rate. Uh, it's a vacation place. Right? People go there to get married. That's why. <laughs> it's, marriage, it's a marriage tourism state. Uh, that's why it has a high marriage rate. Uh, and uh, uh, so other states are basically right on the regression line. Uh, so now we're going to take the absolute distance of each of those lines and set it aside. It's still associated with each state, and that's our list of residuals. Does that make sense? I know some of you calculated this before and you're totally bored. I apologize. But uh, now we're going to take those residuals, and on the graph I've added to this slide in the bottom, uh, the horizontal axis are the marriage rate residuals. It's the variation in marriage rate that's left over after accounting for the average association uh, with age of marriage. And then we look at the correlation between those residuals and divorce rate, and this is nothing, right? So the, if you regress, and again, you shouldn't do this in analysis. This is what multiple regression does internally. Uh, the correlation between divorce rate and the marriage rate residuals is nothing. It's what you got from the multiple regression. But it's just showing you how it sees it inside the model. This is what the model's doing mechanically inside. But it's doing it accounting for all the posterior uncertainty. And this is the point where I wanted to say, you don't know the residuals. The residual is not a single value. It's a distribution. And so if you do the multiple regression all at once, like I showed you, uh, then it handles all of that. You can handle the fact that you don't know the residual exactly, and you get the right estimates with the right standard errors. Uh, but if you do it this way, you don't. Uh, and that's the big sin uh, with it. There are other sins, too. When we get the GLMs, you definitely can never do it this way. But um, it's really good for intuition. Does this make sense? Yeah? Let's look at, uh, point out some interesting cases. Maine has a really, really high divorce rate. It's outside the South. This is a super anomaly. It has, I think it has the nation's highest divorce rate now. Uh, anyone here from Maine? No. Uh, <laughs> I know it's like in this audience, probably not a likely event. But um, last I checked on this, uh, which was a couple weeks ago, there's still no explanation for why Maine's divorce rate is so high. Uh, because it's definitely not a Southern state. The opposite, completely the opposite. Um, okay, let's do very quickly now the flip side. So now you can also take agent marriage. You can pivot the graph in the upper left to make the graph in the upper right. Have agent marriage regressed on marriage rate. There's an average line. There's a new set of residuals. These numbers are different. Uh, and then we can put those on the horizontal axis down here against divorce rate and correlate them. And now there's a real strongly negative. Uh, so after you already know uh, the marriage rate, uh, there's considerable value in knowing age of marriage. But the reverse is not true. Does this make some sense? Was this helpful? Just help you see what's going on? Yeah? Um, this is one of the things that we mean when people talk about statistical control. And of course, the word control comes from the design of experiments, where you're actually setting the values of, of variables that you think are plausibly causal. In observational studies like this one, uh, we don't do that. There's no ethical intervention by which you set the, the marriage rate of a state. I, I assert that would be unethical uh, to do that. <laughs> Other people are less squeamish about these things. Um, so we're stuck with observational studies for large amounts of very important problems. And we want to make uh, causal inferences, though. And multiple regression does offer ways to do that, but only when you pair them with some clear idea about what the causal relationships are among the models. And statistical control means conditioning on the information in one variable. Is there any valuable information in the remaining variables? And that's what statistical control means. But to interpret the effect that happens from statistical control, you need some causal framework, like a DAG or something else. And we'll have examples later on where Controlling for something actually creates a confound. Uh, it can create a confound just as much as it can remove one. In this case, it removes a confound and gives us what I think is the right answer. Uh, later on, it won't. Is there a quick question, Brett? Was that a? I had a quick comment, if you don't mind. OK. I once worked with a biostatistician who said he was very strict and he said that control should only be reserved for experimental studies and observational context, which is to say stratified. 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 <laughs> Stratified. That sounds nice. Sure. Uh, 
That's that'd be nice. Uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy to sign on to a letter that promoted that. It's just my experience with statistical terminology is uh, statisticians are helpless, uh, absolutely helpless. I mean, we've been trying to get people not to call a p-value the probability to null hypothesis is is true for so long. Uh, it's just a total failure, right? Uh, and it's just anyway. That's a that's a rant I won't go off on. It's just. I often feel like I'm just sort of lost at sea with these terminology and I just tell you what they mean and warn you about them, but I, I think it's very hard to aggressively recommend new terminology because you're, you're swamped in the use of these things and, and my responsibility is just to tell you what people mean when they say it and what it actually refers to, right? Um, okay, yeah, so what was my point on this slide? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, these models are not magic, right? Uh, you shouldn't get cocky. Um, uh, there's lots of other stuff going on here, and uh, uh, last thing, last point I wanted to make about this is this is the kind of study where there are lots of potential confounds that arise simply from the fact that we're using average data for each state rather than individual cases. Um, this is a, a famous problem. Uh, uh, so this is the kind of data set that's actually just quite pathological, and it'd be very hard to be sure what's going on. Um, very quickly, counterfactual plots. Uh, these are cases where you uh, hold the other predictor variables constant and you manipulate one of them and you see how the uh, regression line changes. So all the code for generating these is in the text. I encourage you to work through this and get an idea. The concept is fairly straightforward. You're seeing how the model sees the predictor relationships, assuming you could play God and set the values of the predictors to anything. Now, of course, in the real world, we can't do that. Manipulating one of these things will also change other variables. Right? So if, if we're right in our, in our DAG here, for example, if you manipulate uh, agent marriage, you'll also manipulate marriage rate, but not the other way around. Counterfactual plots don't account for that. They just let you play God and set them to any value you like and see how the model works. That's really useful for understanding what the model thinks, but it's not causal inference. Okay? We'll, we'll loop back to causal inference again in a, in a later example. Um, finally, posterior prediction checks. The goal here is twofold. Uh, the first is to figure out if the model, if the approximation of the posterior worked. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and the posterior prediction check will tell you that because there'll be a very poor match between the posterior predictions of the model and the raw data. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to compare the posterior predictions to the raw data. If they bear no resemblance to one another, your, your computer failed, or you failed, or some combination of the two. Right? And that's very useful because things fail. And it's not your fault. Right? <laughs> the universe is hostile to human life. We're all struggling to exist, <laughs> fighting entropy, right? It's all, it's fine. <laughs> and, uh, the other thing is it can inspire you to, to look at the cases that don't fit well and try to figure out what you need to make more robust causal inferences in the system. Uh, so let me give you just one slide about this before I move on to the next example. Uh, what we do here is I'm showing you on the horizontal is the observed divorce rate in each state. On the vertical, is the posterior distribution of, the, of predicted divorce for each state, with the points being the posterior mean, and then the line segments being the 89% intervals uh, of the mean. And the diagonal dashed line is the unity. It's when they're equal. So if there's a state on the line, the model hits it exactly right. Yeah? And that's like for average states. It does that because that's what regression does. It does really good at averages. But then there are states where it's making bad predictions. Uh, like Idaho, let's focus just on Idaho. I mentioned Maine before, so I won't pick on Maine again. Uh, but Idaho, Idaho is, uh, this is a state that no one in Europe knows where it is, right? You just know it's out there <laughs> somewhere. It's got mountains, right? It snows in the winter, yeah. They grow potatoes. Uh, and it has a very high divorce rate. Uh, no, actually, it has a low divorce rate, much lower divorce rate than is predicted for its, agent, its average age of marriage. So there's a low average age of marriage in Idaho, and a very low divorce rate. And that's why there's a mismatch between what the model thinks, right? So observed divorce, it's on the left of zero. It has a low divorce rate. The model thinks it's going to have a divorce rate that's more than one standard deviation above the mean. It's getting Idaho really wrong. And anybody who's lived in the US, or the West, especially the Western US, knows the answer to this. What is it about Idaho? And the answer is the Latter-day Saints. Uh, there is a large population of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, colloquially known as the Mormons, in Idaho, and they have that, those members of that church have a very low divorce rate. Uh, and that's what explains it. Uh, uh, Utah, as well, is another state with a very high frequency of that. Uh, Utah is less of an outlier, though. 
Okay, so in any particular case, looking at the cases that are predicted badly can give you ideas, uh, help you understand what's going on <coughs> in the system. All right, let me spend the, the remaining 15 minutes uh, talking about another good thing that regression can do. Uh, one good thing it can do is it can reveal spurious correlations, like the thing I just showed you. Statistical control or stratification, that's a better term, uh, can tell us the difference between um, uh, whether there's a path uh, actually from one variable to another or whether it's just pretending uh, to have that path because of some common influence on the two variables. Another thing it can do is when there are two predictors that both influence an outcome, but in different directions, uh, they will mask one another. And you need both in the model to see that either one of them matters, or, or rather to get the total actual causal effect of both of them. And I call this mask association. Uh, and I want to give you a, a real example um, from a primate data set. Uh, and again, this tends to arise. You have two predictors. They're both real effects on the outcome, but they act in different directions on it, and they're correlated with one another. And as a consequence, uh, in nature, they hide one another's effects. And if you don't measure both of them, then you'll lead, it'll lead you to believe that neither one of them matters as much as it actually does. Uh, so um, I should also say, last thing I note here, uh, another thing that really matters here is noise in predictors, uh, which is something we'll deal with much later in the course, uh, all, can also mask association. But it's, it's mechanistically a different effect. So this won't deal with everything. Uh, so this is something that's called residual confounding. If you have a lot of measurement error, uh, because your measurement predictor is bad, uh, you can make, you can not see that it's actually a causal effect. That's probably pretty straightforward. This is called residual confounding. Um, in fact, it, the predictor that is measured most precisely will often show up in such studies as being the truly causal one, even if it's not. Uh, I think there's a lot of this that goes on. Uh, all right, three uh, primates here, uh, one lemur and two monkeys. Uh, so on the left, we have uh, U lemur, uh, fulvus, which is uh, uh, really one of the more magnificent of the lemurs, in my opinion. We are primatologists in the audience here. We can argue about this at lunch. Uh, but I think it's a great one. It's a really great one. Everybody likes the one that looks like a raccoon. This is, this is a better lemur. And uh, we're going to be interested in this data in the association between milk energy, how energetic the milk is uh, that these primate species get to their young, uh, and how brainy they are. Uh, by a particular measure is their neocortex. And why are we interested in this? Because, well, I'm an anthropologist. And what are anthropologists interested in? Brain evolution. Why? Because humans have big brains, right? <laughs> uh, we're interested in things that are, that are conspicuous about our species. It's, it's, uh, it's very narcissistic, <laughs> as it feels. Uh, uh, but it's also, it's, it's a general topic that's of interest uh, beyond uh, primates and human evolution as well. Uh, and Primates are mammals. Like all mammals, they feed their um, dependent offspring with milk. And some mammals have really highly energetic milk. Seals, for example. Seals basically ooze butter to their offspring. <laughs> and uh, a good image for you. And why? Because they're out, they can't carry their offspring with them while they're foraging. So they plop up on the ice, they ooze some butter, and they go back in the water and they get some fish, right? That's the seal life. It's glamorous. And um, uh, primates, in contrast, carry their offspring on them almost all the time, most of them. Some really small ones like Galagos don't necessarily, but uh, most of them do. And as a consequence, the energy density in primate milk tends to be lower. Uh, it's definitely, it's more closer to the average for mammals. Um, uh, human milk is, is uh, not particularly energetically rich. Um, so then we have Homo sapiens in the middle. Uh, we have our uh, 0.7 kilocalories per gram in our milk and we're 75% Neo, of our brain mass is neocortex, which is the wrinkly part, right? And then finally, another very brainy, um, uh, by some measures, the brainiest uh, primate is Cebus, uh, energetic, highly energetic milk, more so than humans, and it's 68% uh, neocortex by brain mass. So if we had a bigger sample of primates, we're interested in the connection between these things because the hypothesis is that you need, if you have a bigger brain, you have to grow that in your offspring, so you have to give them more energy. So can we see a signal of selection on milk energy from braininess, right? Do humans put more energy in their milk than, uh, than lemurs uh, because they're brainier? So here's a data set that I received from my colleague Katie Hind. I know some of you know Katie. And uh, uh, she kindly sent me all this data. Uh, we've got a sample of primate species and we've got neocortex uh, percent of their brain mass is neocortex and we've got the kilocalories per gram 
in their milk, and we've got their body mass of the moms. Uh, and what I want to show you is, well, this is what's called a pairs plot. Uh, these things are, uh, there's a particularly strong correlation in these data. If you look at the intersection of log mass and neocortex percent, you'll see that there's a diagonal upwards line. That's a positive correlation between the magnitude of the body mass. So when you take a log of a variable, like think of it, it's now magnitudes. It's like the strength of an earthquake, right? It's not the absolute value, but it's the exponent on it. That's what called a magnitude. So the more magnitudinous uh, the body mass, uh, that is strongly correlated with neocortex percent. These things are correlated. Uh, bigger primates have are brainier primates uh, in the sense that they have more neocortex in particular, not just their raw brains are bigger. That's true too. Uh, you see no particular strong correlation between either log mass and nor neocortex percent and kilocalories a gram per milk. It's much cloudier there. You see this? I'm asking you to do regressions in your head here, which is unfair, but we'll do the real thing in a minute. Uh, so what's going on? If you just did bivariate regressions, not much would happen. We'll do that in a second. Uh, okay, here's what we call the necessary sermon on priors. Again, um, we need to do some prior predictive simulations here to figure out what's going on. Again, you can standardize uh, these variables. That helps a lot. That, that helps us with it. alpha. What I want to show you on the left is if we use default priors, uh, I think of normal 0, 1 is pretty flat, but actually conventional priors would be like normal 0, 100. You'll see priors like that all the time. And of course, if you're not doing the Bayesian model, the, it's essentially flat because you're saying before you see the data, anything's possible. And, uh, uh, and then we sample regression lines from this prior and it's crazy, right? It's like a Jackson Pollock painting. Uh, and uh, this is not a good prior. Now again, th this sample is small, but it's plenty strong to overwhelm even the silliest prior here, but we're practicing when it's safe because it won't be safe at some point in your life and you want to you practice ahead of time. So all we need to do to get the regression lines to live in the outcome space, we can contract alpha because we don't want it to move from zero that much. We know it should be about zero. And we need to bring the slope parameters down so they're tighter as well. And so we're back to this normal 0.5. And if you standardize the predictor in the outcome, a slope prior of normal 0.5 will keep you in the outcome space for the most part. It's not a terrible prior. Okay, here are the bivariate regressions of each uh, predictor on our outcome of interest, which is the energy density of milk, kilocalories per gram. Uh, there's a slightly positive uh, relationship between neocortex percent and kilocalories per gram, but only very slightly, and you'll see that bow tie uh, compatibility interval um, is pretty wide. Yeah, this is it's not super exciting. And there's a slightly negative relationship between log body mass and kilocalories per gram. Uh, now look what's going to happen when we uh, put them both in the same model. Here's the multiple regression model. Nothing too shocking. We add, uh, there's two terms in the linear model now, two slope priors, basically the same. We run, now look at the, the marginal posteriors down in the table below. Uh, for neocortex percent, it's consistently positive, far above zero, all the posterior mass is above zero. And now for um, log body mass, all the posterior mass is below zero. These are very strong, consistent relationships now that both are in there. Let me show you this graphically. Right at the top are the bivariate regressions plotted against the data. And then at the bottom, these are the counterfactual plots, holding these things, holding the other predictor constant and then varying the horizontal axis in each plot. You'll see the multiple regression sees both of them as important predictors of milk density, of energy density of milk, sorry, uh, but only if they're both present. And this is the masking effect. Uh, one is positively related to the outcome, the other is negatively related to the outcome, and they're correlated with one another. So bigger primates tend to have bigger brains. Bigger brains need more energy. <laughs> bigger bodies need less. Well, it's not that you need less, it's that they spend, they have longer developmental times, and the milk and energy density goes down as a consequence. Give them more water, that's what you do. So they, they're, these are antagonistic effects, but they're correlated in the same species. Uh, and, but there's enough, you know, they're not perfectly the same. They don't have all exactly the same information, so in a multiple regression, you can pull it apart. This sort of effect can happen a lot in a lot of data sets. In a DAG, how does this arise? Um, here's the simplest way it could arise. And, I give you the code on the left to simulate a fake data set which exhibits this masking relationship. I think this is, this is how I learn these things. I figure out if I can fake the effect 
then I understand it, right? And we don't publish our fake data, but we definitely work with it, right? So this is how we're, we're sure that we understand what's going on. Uh, in DAG form, what you see here is at the middle of the top of this DAG, uh, we've got an unobserved, that's what U stands for, an unobserved compound. There's some common cause of uh, body mass M and neocortex percent N, some life history optimization variable. So ecological or whatever it is, right? Pick your favorite thing in the primate evolutionary literature. Uh, and then uh, the causal influence of each of those, of body mass and neocortex percent on energy density, one is positive and one is negative. And this relationship is sufficient to generate the pattern that we see in the actual data uh, where this happens. So this sort of stuff can happen a lot, right? Uh, you have these unobserved. If we could measure you, that's what we'd regress on <laughs> uh, because that would tell us what's actually going on. But we can't. Instead, we have the individual life history characters and we end up regressing on those and we get very, very confused. Yeah, well, that's, what I, that's how I explain the primate brain evolution literature. It's very, very confused, right? Does this make sense? Yeah? Um, I've got three minutes, so I'm right on time. <laughs> uh, I want to end by saying some useful things about categorical variables. Um, often we have predictor variables which are not really continuous. They're, instead, they're, they represent discrete unordered categories. Things like country you're in, like Albion, uh, for example. <laughs> uh, but gender or species, you want to include those on the right-hand side of a regression formula but obviously they're not continuous. You can't be more Albion, <laughs> right? Well, I guess you can. Some people are too much Albion, to be honest. <laughs> but I should stop talking. <laughs> but uh, uh, th these are useful variables to use because the mean can vary by these categories, but you can't enter them as continuous values. Right. So what do we do? And, and I'm sure most of you know what you do, but I want to say something that's a little bit different and unconventional here. There are two general approaches. The first is to use a dummy variable, and this is what most automated software is going to do. It's going to take uh, uh, your categorical variable and it's going to make it into what are called dummy variables. I'll show you what this means on the next slide. The other strategy, which I think is nearly always superior, is to create something called an index variable. And I'll also show you what that means. I might run out of time here, but then uh, we'll, we'll finish up next time. So uh, what's a dummy variable? You take your categorical variable and you code it into a series of zero one indicator variables. Indicator, calling these indicator variables is a little bit, a little nicer. Dummy, they're called dummy not because they're dumb. Uh, that would have a B in it, right? <laughs> uh, but because they stand for something, right? They stand in for it. It's a dummy, a decoy uh, variable. And so for example, in the uh, Kalahari height data, there's a column uh, male and it's coded one and zero. That's a dummy variable. Right? Zero means, means not male. <laughs> That's all it means, and one means male. Uh, so height varies by um, sex, and, uh, at least in humans, and so you can include it in, the, in a linear regression of height in that data set, and this is what the structure would look like. You, it, the linear model, it looks just like a continuous predictor, but because it's been coded using zero and one, effectively all it does is turn a parameter on and off and it adjusts the mean. It effectively makes two intercepts, one for not male and one for male, right? Female is the only other sex or gender in this data set, so that means not female. Uh, uh, and then, so alpha is the intercept uh, for females in this data set, and alpha plus beta m is the intercept for males. Does that make sense? The problem with dummy variables, let me set this up and we'll resolve this uh, next time, is that as you get more and more possible categories, you need a bunch of them. And the linear model gets long and messy. And then you have to pick priors for every one of those differences from the baseline category. So like with seasons, if you've got uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall, you need three dummy variables. One of these will be the, the aliased out category, and that'll be alpha, will be its expectation. And then the others have their own slopes that you add in. Um, if you have a lot, uh, imagine that it was country. Uh, I don't know how many countries there are in the world, but there are a lot. Uh, you need that many dummy variables minus one. Right? It gets pretty annoying uh, very fast and hard to manage. And then you have to set priors uh, for those things. And, and the consequence of this is that you end up assuming that one of the categories, uh, well, in this case, uh, one of the categories is less uncertain than all the others because 
two parameters make the prediction for all the categories except for one, right? So think about in the height example, for females, alpha is, is the only prior that matters, but for males, alpha and beta matter, and they get added together. And your model thinks a priori that you're less certain about the height of males than you are about the height of females, but that's not true. You'd like to assign them both the same prior if you really didn't know anything about the ordering of them, which is not true because you're a human, but uh, that would be the case. So this is a, a, a hidden thing about using dummy variables. So um, the better option is index variables, and I'm going to stop right here, and this is where we'll pick up when you come back. I'll teach you about index variables, and this is the strategy we'll use for most of the examples in the book. It's easier. It's absolutely easier in almost every way. Okay, thank you for your time, and I'll see you on Friday.